Okay, good evening, everyone. It's 5 30. I'm going to call the meeting to order. If you'll all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, feels like we haven't been here in a long time. We haven't. Okay, uh, first up is communication from parents and district residents. I have no one sign up to speak in person this evening. Uh, do we have anyone online that wants to speak? Okay, well, there you go. We're moving on. Uh, da, 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 da. So next on the agenda is consent items. I move to approve consent items as written. Second. Perfect. Uh, comments or questions? If not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunbeck? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next up, superintendent and board member reports. It's awful early in the year <laughs> since we're not in school but let's see what everyone has to say yeah well august is actually a pretty busy time for yes. us here um, in the district as we're preparing for the start of school so i just wanted to report on some of the trainings and professional development onboarding activities that are happening so we've had building administrators teachers and new staff members participating in training PD and onboarding activities over the past couple of weeks. Uh, we're implementing some new orientation and onboarding processes this year to ensure that uh, new staff members to the district have all of the um, information and training that they need to successfully start their new jobs. Um, also new this year, we're doing some very focused professional development for building administrators and teacher teams to support professional learning communities. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about professional learning communities or PLCs. Um, you know, PLC work is focused on teacher collaboration, on standards aligned learning assessment, data analysis, intervention and enrichment to support team school and district goals for students. So uh, we talk uh, quite a bit about PLCs and I just want to provide a little bit of background of, about you know, why we focus on PLC work. So John Hattie, um, you may have heard of John Hattie or maybe not, but he's a really well-known educational researcher who's studied visible learning, um, is really well-known in educational circles, and he ranked 138 influences that are related to learning outcomes for students from uh, those that have very positive effects and those that have uh, negative effects. In doing this big study and meta-analysis, he found that the average effect size of uh, interventions for um, student learning influences that he studied was 0.40. So um, that was kind of the average effect size. So he, he then found uh, influences or effects that are much more positive on student learning and much more negative on student learning. For example, his research shows that student depression has a negative effect size of negative 0.36 on learning outcomes. So a big negative effect on student learning. Um, exclusionary discipline, like suspending students or expelling students has a negative effect size of 0 0.20 on student learning and poverty has a negative effect size of 0 point, negative 0.12 on learning outcomes. On the flip side, his research shows that collective teacher efficacy has a high positive influence on student learning outcomes with an effect size of 1.57. Meaning it's it's of his research, it's like either the highest or second highest thing that you can do to positively influence student learning outcomes. So what is teacher or collective teacher efficacy? It's, it's really the collective belief of school staff in their ability to positively influence and affect student learning. So it, it's, it's really about collaborative conversations based on evidence and results and getting uh, teacher teams together to see 
the relationship between what they're doing and the effect that it's having on students, looking at those student data results and and having the conversation about what are you doing to get those results and then learning from one another. So that's essentially what PLCs do and research shows that they have a high positive influence. One of the highest things you can do to influence st student learning in a positive way and that outweighs the negative influence of things like poverty, for example. So PLCs are not new. Uh, there's language in our KSD KEA contract that's been there for many years. Uh, we did add some language to it in the last uh, negotiations and we have early release Wednesdays and, and part of that time is for professional learning community work. This year we're really focusing on increasing our support for professional learning communities, uh, providing training and resources, uh, professional development like what we uh, did this last uh, spring and some ongoing work to really strengthen PLC work in the district so we can increase learning outcomes for students because it's a research based best practice and we have some work to do to improve our student learning outcomes at our next board meeting. Uh, we'll be providing an update on uh, where we are with our data district wide. We now are uh, just kind of finalizing looking at our our state um, assessment data. And so we've got a goal report, standing goal report that'll happen at the next board meeting. And so, um, you know, there's there's some good news and there's work to do. Uh, but PLC, a focus on helping support PLCs and schools is one of the things that we can research shows we can do to help improve student learning. So I just wanted to touch on that tonight. Okay, thank you. So so is, are the PLCs, is that something that we're doing at every school or what's where are we doing there, that? There's contract language uh, okay. in that it is and time okay. um, with early release Wednesdays and early release at high schools that's specifically for this work. Um, where we are is, you know, historically we've had some schools do some more professional development and learning with their federal funding um, and things like that. In fact, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that are welcome back. A couple schools who've been doing PLCs um, at, a, at a high level for uh, a number of years. We haven't had a district wide approach really to providing support um, and training and, and so forth, you know, resources to actually do the work. So that's our focus right now uh, because the schools that have been doing it for a while have really used their federal funding and not all schools receive federal funding. So we're, we're you know, and then of course, you know, COVID, <laughs> all of those things. It's a good time for us to kind of re um, reset and provide more resources to schools to be able to really do this work with fidelity. I heard you say, I'm sorry, what are you going to ask? No, please go ahead. I heard you say federal funding. Uh, many of the, a lot of the proposals for the state was a included professional development. Did we get any funding from the state? The state provides uh, the, uh, you know, I have to just double check with Vic on on if there's any, you know, new funding sources. But they uh, uh, last year they increased the amount that they pay for teacher professional development days. So uh, they fund three of our teacher professional development days and then they um, they uh, created a calendar essentially in every other year calendar that says, you know, you either focus, you have to use one of those days focused on social emotional learning or cultural competency, diversity, equity and inclusion and it flips back and forth year to year. So one of the days is like designated for those topics and then the other the other two days we have more flexibility at the local level to determine how what kind of PD we provide during those two days. So state funds three days of PD. Yeah. Thank you. And I will follow up with Vic and do, follow up with the board if there's additional funding that's new this year that I don't know about. I don't Thank think there so is, but I could be wrong. Thank you. All right. Okay, got anything going on? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, just uh, attended the active shooter training a week or so ago um, at Chinook um, and just grateful for the partnership with with KSD uh, or with with the Kenoka Police Department. Um, 
and uh, it's just it's just eye-opening the amount of work and effort that goes into that training and so i appreciate that um and then um if if the board's okay with it uh dr pierce could you update us in the community on the sro stuff next meeting just a quick update to share where we're at and all that stuff so they know we're limited yeah the, yeah the sros and yeah. the and the safety officers yeah. just a quick update so sure. we know we're and wrong. i did provide Anything some information to the yeah. board but we can do a more public and yeah I, I, that's, that's that's a good idea i did kind of want to wait until school starts so more people yeah. are you know yeah. paying attention but i did provide the board some information mm -hmm. on where we are with that yeah i just yeah okay, i just gotcha. think in the community just for sure yeah that's it thank you um so I, I, I attended several community meetings. Those are really good. I try to always try to get to a couple of those every month and uh, just kind of get where people are at. Um, I actually also got invited to um, speak at two different times. One was at a church, one was at another community meeting where this asked questions about our school district and stuff. So it was kind of kind of nice. And um, I just gave them my my opinion, one man's opinion on on things, and and they were really happy. Um, I, I was able to attend both of the active shooter trainings. Uh, again, I gave us one. Tracy, you were there with one. That was kind of fun. And um, um, I would just like to echo what Gabe says. I mean, we actually have our first officer here. You, maybe you could stand up and wave. To, he's 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 uh, he's great. We him and I chatted for a long time. And uh, and anyway, we've got just a, a great crew. Where they work really hard, running through different all different types of scenarios. What if this happens? What if that happens? They debrief. It was just it was really really cool to see all the work they put in. Um, and our, our our local police, they're all really great people. Um, I had some several staff reach out to me about the the upcoming vector training modules thing. I was going to talk chat with you about that. Just, just yeah, so I'll t talk to you offline about that, but um, and probably Doug a little bit. But anyway, uh, that's just in the community this week. Thank you, Diane. I forgot to bring my list, so I'll do that you next wait. month. No, I'll do it next <laughs> month. <laughs> Yeah, I had a couple of things. I spent quite a bit of time over the last month and a half with Os uh, the young man who wanted to start a financial class. Ashwin, Ashwin, Ashwin Joshua. Yeah. Uh, when I met with <laughs> Diane, introduced him to Diane, well, reintroduced him to Diane, and Diane shared what she could do for him and introduced him to some state uh, representatives, not representatives, but uh, committee leaders and, and people in power in the state and they were very helpful he was uh impressed uh, by the interest that they put into what he had to say and they made some uh not promises but they it, well i guess i can say promise they promised that they would help him they didn't did not promise that they could establish that program but they they showed him how to go the steps to go about it so that was really good and uh then, uh, well, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit. We were invited to go to uh, the opening of the uh, Heritage University here in, in Kenwood. And that was very, that was very nice. Uh, that's a promising program. And I didn't realize it until they said it that now all three Tri-Cities have a university and a, a college or a university. That's pretty impressive for such a small community, a medium-sized community, but not exactly small. But that's, that's what I've been up to. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I also have been emailing back and forth with Mr. Joshi, so we're going to hopefully get together with him either this week or next week. I keep kicking it down the road here trying to get my state representative to sit still for a second. It's been more difficult than one would think. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then the Heritage Her 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 University was great. It's nice to offer more and more uh, continuing, you know, further education options for the city. It was always good to see. So it, it was a it was a very, very nice ceremony. So it was fun to go to the uh, Okay. All right. Uh, next up, we have reports and discussions. We have our technology operations update. Mr. Cone gets to make his annual State of the Union address. <laughs> State of the Union. Good evening. How's it going? Good. Let's see if I can launch this. It's already, yeah, so there we go. Already, <coughs> all right. So, um, 
staffing, I'm I'm super excited to report that uh, we are fully staffed Yay. this year at the start of school. So uh, we're just completed the interviews for the interns, and so they'll be on board by the time uh, school starts. Um, and we've also made a change. Uh, Eric Beach has uh, worked with us for a long time, and uh, I just wanted to call out that we've uh, changed his position to Director of Information Technology. Uh, he's done a, a great job of uh, supporting the department and the district, and so does a lot of work for us. Otherwise, uh, you guys can see the list of staff. So, uh, so uh, increased support for staff and students. We're always trying to find new ways to do that. So, we're doing some more. You know, we can't staff it 24/7, so we're doing some more things to have more, more and more resources available. Uh, in an offline manner for them. Um, some of the things we're working on this year is some of the secretaries so that they, if they can't get to the help desk or just people, we've built a manual. Uh, last time I looked, it's about 200 pages now for their job functions around things like uh, Power School, Parent Square, some different things. So we're getting those out there. Uh, for students, there's different resources. Some of the applications provide 24 seven support. So if the kids have a problem, they have a, a usually a chat connection that they can make to support from the application. So we're just doing that. Um, and the kids, uh, we're getting more and more information out through the librarians, uh, especially for the secondary. So if the kids having a problem with their Chromebook, the kid has a little place with a cheat sheet that tells them how to just do a quick reset on it. So that they can reset it. As soon as they reset it, they log back in and it, basically is, is brand new. So it gives them a chance to get going again. Um, so our help desk uh, and our tickets and a survey. Um, we have at the, every time we create a ticket in, in our help desk system, uh, we send out a survey. So we ask the people, you know, how we did and, you know, to, to give us an overall rating uh, of one to five. Um, well, we were partway through the year and I, um, was kind of challenging Jake Glason in his one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with me, uh, why the system I didn't think was working because there were no notifications this year or problems. So uh, he and I kind of sat there and we dug into it and discovered that there were no notifications because the system notifies us if we score a three or lower. And uh, at that point in time, the only score we had was a five. Everybody had given a perfect score. So uh, we were super excited about that. We went on and we had a little fun. Um, about two months later, we got our only low score of the year, the only one. And we uh, like, oh, I got to follow up on this and then find out it's it's Mike Way that's got the low score. Mike is our go to for customer service. So I, I start exchanging messages with the teacher and try to arrange a time to go talk to him. And finally, by the time we connect up, she's like, she has no idea. <laughs> she's like, I had great service. <laughs> so it was funny. So we ended the year with basically a perfect score. Um, let's see, our cloud stuff, uh, we're still continuing to uh, look at cloud, always figuring out what's uh, what's happening. Uh, more and more services, we continue to move to the cloud. Um, some by our choice, like Rapid Identity, our main, one of our main login systems, and it provides the link for the kids to use. We've moved out to the cloud, so it's up and uh, up there and reliable. Um, that vendor, it was pretty cost neutral for us to do that. We've had a couple of other vendors who've made it um, not cost neutral. They've uh, they've made it a penalty if we stayed on site with it. So they've uh, so we've gone ahead and moved to the cloud on some of their software. Uh, one of the systems being our Jamf, which manages our Mac and iPad environment. So so we're doing that where it comes up and makes sense. Uh, we've got about three more years uh, left on the data center here in the in this building, and at the end of that, we'll be doing a well, probably the year before, we'll be doing a big evaluation to determine if we're going to move that data center to the cloud or rebuild the new data center again. So, uh, still continuing with our same things on our devices. So we're using iPads for our K through two students, plus some special education or some different environments. And then we're using Chromebooks with the kids. Our um, cost on our devices is starting to climb up. We're getting closer to $700 on uh, the average cost of our devices now. 
Um, but we're doing, uh, I will say that we run a little more high-end device. We get a little longer life out of it. Uh, so it's, it's working out for us on a cost per year basis. Uh, the laptops we were doing for staff, um, I remember the day when I thought it was outrageous that we'd gone to $1,000, and now we're running about $1,900 for those. Um, so costs are creeping up on us, so we're kind of keeping an eye on that with Vic and the budget. Um, we, on our backups and our air gap stuff and security, we um, have added another feature into our system. So kind of what we have is we have this offline backup. It's comes this the equipment basically turns on for uh, it's about an hour at night makes a copy of any files that it needs to into that particular area and then shuts off the connection so that you physically have to walk in the back room to reach that equipment other than during that hour um, so while it's doing that we've added a feature in there as it pulls all those files in there it also now is reviewing them to determine if any of those files have been crypto locked potentially leaving us vulnerable to ransomware. So we're checking that as those files go in and out now uh, for another added protection. Um, we're doing uh, basically the same things on our internet and safety. So we have the content keeper, which has been our filter for a long time. We use it to test things. Um, they were bought by a company called Imperio this last year, and they've been, um, Content Keeper was developing a, I'll call it a parent uh, locking feature. Uh, they're still working on that, but development got slowed a little bit while they went through that merger. So we're still beta testing that stuff. It just isn't quite ready, um, but we'll continue to work with them this year. Um, lockdown, um, we've, um, we've done some things to students' accounts. So we've had a huge problem with staff and students. Uh, their credentials get compromised and we were having logins basically all over the world. And students were a problem because it was pretty easy for the adults for us to put uh, MFA and multi-factor authentication on there. It's kind of like maybe you do with your bank account, send you a text message or an app code that you punch in to, to gain access. So we did that with the adults and um, we were struggling with what to do with the students. And David Stevens came up with the creative, creative idea of taking and putting on a phone number that is a phone that sits in the IT department. Um, it just rings. We never answer it. In fact, we shut the ringer off because we got tired of it ringing. So we put that as the MFA on all kids' accounts. And so the kids, as long as they're on their Chromebook or their iPad provided by the district, they're never going to get asked for MFA anyway. Those, that situation is whitelisted and it just lets them log in. But if they start to log in from another device or someone else starts to log in as them from another device, it will ask for that. And basically the, it tells them, uh, we're calling this phone number to, to give you your access code. That phone rings and no one answers. Um, <laughs> so what's happened is the kids, the few kids that, that really want their email on their cell phone or they want to do it from their home computer, um, we were planning to communicate to them, uh, you know, when school got started again, and a few of them have already figured it out. They immediately called the help desk and they've gone through and we've set up either moms or their own cell phone number as their MFA login. So it's been working really well. We dropped several thousand false attacks uh, a month. So um, we are always out there running around looking at things for safety. We still continue to use our Palo Alto for our firewalls. We have, um, we're using the Microsoft A3, Microsoft A5 security licenses uh, on staff. Uh, so that gives us some better email blocking and we're continuing to implement some more features on that. So there's a uh, little reports on that to help us. The other thing that we're doing is we're always testing some new software, looking at it. Uh, you see that picture in there of the uh, guy with the uh, pressure washer. Uh, that came up from a product that we were testing called IntelliSeed. And that product would uh, determine if there was a gun present. So it would look, and in this case, it's uh, sent an alert and reported that it was 62% chance that that was a gun that the guy was holding. So it let us know. Um, 
So it's an interesting piece of technology, and we continue to test these different pieces looking for something that will help us and something that's cost effective. Um, we've also um, increased our critical start, uh, does our monitoring on our systems with us, and we've kind of increased the services that we're using with them to help us be faster at responding to uh, attacks. So just another thing that we're up to. One-to-one uh, -one program, we continue to have that. Uh, we've got about 20,000 Chromebooks out there and about 4,800 iPads. Uh, this last year, we replaced 7,500 Chromebooks. Uh, right now, during this school year, we're not gonna be replacing any Chromebooks. We had the original design that was supposed to be so many a year, every year, COVID screwed that up and we'll try to get back to that eventually. But um, so Vic's been helpful and flexible with the, the budgeting so that we can deal with these peaks and valleys right now. Um, we will have to do like uh, between 750 and 1,000 iPads this coming year. So that'll be a, a project. Uh, we implemented our learning management system uh, applications and we continue to do training on that. This week we just completed more training with uh, teachers on Seesaw and Schoology. Um, and uh, we have uh, Unified Insights that we are continuing to implement. And it's just a data visualization software, uh, gives us graphing. Um, and what we're trying to do with it is one of the things is to reporting on uh, long longitudinal data and trying to align that to the strategic plan. So where we have KPIs on the strategic plan, we want to get those built in this year into Unified Insights so that we can see those and how we're doing against those as the year goes along. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. You said that um, you had to replay. You will need to replay 700 to 1,000 um, iPads this iPads year. iPads this year. Just because they fell apart, or what? No, oh, uh, no. New ones? In this case, this is. Uh, they are just at their end of their life. Okay. Uh, these will be. This is going to be their sixth year of service, okay. uh, and just they're starting to slow down. Uh, the iPads have actually held up really well for us. Uh, Chromebooks amazingly hold up really well at the elementary and the high school level, not so well in middle school. <laughs> can, we, can we give the families the options to buy those if we, uh, you know, at a, I don't know if it's even legal to do so, but if, if they could buy I, The surplus sale mm -hmm. would be the place for that. Um, I know we've looked there in the past. There's been, uh, I think there's an exemption for low income yes. uh -huh. uh, that we might be able to take advantage of. I'd have to do some more research on that again. It would be uh, great if they were given the option when it was time to turn them in and you give us $25 you can keep. Okay, we can look at that. Yep. Gave me a question? Uh, yeah, Ron, two quick questions. One, um, what's the service level like time frame for help desk tickets? Is it like within 24 hours, 48 hours? What's the turnaround time for? All right. Uh, so on an email, uh, so if they're emailing the response, we're hopefully for 24 hours on an email response. I know that we won't meet that uh, in August uh, and early part of September. We just don't have enough staff to, to come close. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and then phone is of course live answer. Uh, they monitor the queue to see how long the queue is getting. Um, the uh, resolution, we don't have a specified SLA on resolution because oftentimes we're, uh, we're held up by different things. It may be ordering parts or different things. So we've never bothered to create that. Yeah, okay. And then, um, on our devices, whether it's whenever you're connected to our network and in, in class, our so, can you go to social media sites? Can you just type in facebook.com and log in and dink around on Facebook on your or grade Instagram level. or anything like that? Depends on your grade level. So if I use Facebook, for example, uh, high school students can go to Facebook, uh, elementary and middle school students cannot. 
So on your on your Chromebook, a high school student could log into Facebook in the middle of class and surf through Facebook and not could, pay attention. Could, uh, but if the teacher wants to prevent that, uh, we provided a product called Net Support, and the teacher can block any and all activity during class with that device or with that software. On that note, uh, you know, when I'm at home and I'm doing my research on the school board and reading Tracy's long, long <laughs> messages, I get tired and I want to do a little solitaire. <laughs> oh, come on. It blocks it. Huh. I can't That's do. right. You can't do games. I can't do solitaire. I can't do um, no. Sudoku. If you would go find an educational game, we'd let you play it. Those are educational. <laughs> Go to, go to the Khan Academy. You can play the math games. Yeah, oh, there you go. Ahead. So I just said it to <laughs> We'll talk later on. <laughs> I have another question. Okay. Um, there, the new state law this year about fixing digital devices, has that helped us in any way? It hasn't done too too much for or against us. Yeah. We're, uh, for the most part, we've got methods of repair now. We don't do a lot of our own uh repair although we do a little bit but it's you know mostly we've outsourced that okay. can i follow oh sorry go ahead. that's a very good question you have more meetings i know i know i got some questions too so I, I'm I, I, I do so. this is a legitimate serious question uh you mentioned that the ipads are for the younger kids and then so why are we introducing them to one format and then they get two grade letters later and so, you introduce them to another format before we did the one-to-one, uh, -one, we had a large project that involved a bunch of teachers, principals. Uh, I think there was even some parents on the on the committees then. Uh, and there was reviews of what the applications were available and what was what was there to do with the different things. And it was just the applications were overwhelmingly better for those grade levels um, on that iPad device than they were on, say, a Chromebook. I, and I do know, I mean, I know other schools that, that view like a Chromebook all the way through. So, um, and then the other was the creation. The, actually, when it got down to some of the creation and the typing, um, it's, it was like not, keyboards had, at that time were extremely expensive on an iPad. Um, there was only one keyboard that would work with state testing, and that was a problem. So that was a factor that we used it said, okay, we don't want to be that device for K-12. Okay. Thank you. Just, just to follow up on my, my question, Ron. So as a high school student, I could be sitting on my Chromebook in class, surfing social media, and the only way we would know is if the teacher caught them and had them Oh, I can, no, I can, we can pull it, reports on it on the system. And tell there's recording that we can pull. Okay. Yeah. And, and teachers have it on their screen and for each class. And so if you're all working and Ron's playing solitaire, the teacher can send him a little message and say, um, Ron, please get back to work. And then okay. if he does it again, boom, he's okay. And that's what happens, I don't You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> we get you back to work. <laughs> so what what age kids get iPads again? What's the? Uh, K through two. K through two. What? types of things do they do on those iPads? Like, what are they doing? Um, one of the activities that I can think of that I know a teacher doing is the kids record their own reading. So they'll they'll read and record themselves and then they can listen back to it. Um, they do some other, I mean, there's some math stuff. We use it in stuff. Imagine Learning. Yeah. On, yeah. Imagine we learning. use it in so special education a lot. So yeah. Um, so we have, <laughs> we have parents here, parents. Uh, no, yeah, you know, okay. yeah, you got examples. I would yeah. thank you, Diane. I got it. Thank you for saying no ninety times. Um, so I would be interested in in having these, in in hearing the feedback from the paras and from the teachers if they're if they're really being utilized and used and if it's something that they need or are they more of a distraction or are they more good than bad. You know, um, I know we, we can't do, we can't, I can't ask you this question, but I would like to know that, so hang out after being. I can follow check. up and yeah. we can seek some input that, that you know, through a survey or something that gives you, you know, a good swath of feedback and I can follow up and, and do that. Yeah, and that'd be great. Mm -hmm. And then, so it, it, I'm just going to piggyback off of Gabe's comment here. Um, do, we all, do we all agree that kids probably don't need to be using social media during 
school hours? Is there, is there an application which we think there are some to use? classes that are using social media? Can we that. reverse that so that the teacher can turn it? So it's just, the default is that it's off and then we think the teacher can turn it on. So like, OK, in this class, we're going to use social media. We're not at the on. moment. That is not a not a quick. If we lock it off, it's it's off. It's um, that's not a quick fix on that one. So the default is always on unless the teacher just because it just seems like that for the most part we don't the kids should not be on social shouldn't even have access to social media during this during the school hours while they're sitting in class on their Chromebook, right? It's I mean a lot just, I'm not, not saying anything crazy, it's logical. I I think that's a teacher and classroom management issue okay. from my perspective. Okay. Um they've they've got tools they can do things to I mean, they can set it up so that they walk into class and their standard blocks are immediately on all the kids the minute the class starts. Okay, I hope, they're, so. I hope the teacher is using that. Um, another, I have a question about push notifications to parents. I mean, I get I get them on my cell phone, you know, I get emails, text messages all throughout the school year and through the day and through updates, which are very good. My question is about when, when with counselors like if a, if a kid meets with a counselor any kind of a guidance counselor or any kind of emotional counselor or whatever is there a way we can set up so the teacher so that so that counselor can just just simply put a quick push notification that sends out to the parents that they read that they say hey i met with your kid today we had a discussion please chat with your kid about the discussion and if you have further questions then you can contact me or something like that that's or, yeah so what, we got to check the state law on that because i don't that's what I'm asking about. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the I don't school, know about that. that. Not, not, I'm going to tell you technically, <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's Legally so or exactly. any other thing. You can do yeah. it. Whoops. And, and I'll interject. I, I, I agree with Ron. I mean, it, there, technically, sure, right? Technically, those kinds of things could be set up. It's um, it's the, is it feasible? Um, kind of all, and all of the other implications around um, around it that we would have to talk through so it's not i mean technically if the question is well, that's the first question technology perspective because last time we talked about it you were make you were saying that i don't know how that's possible and so i just want that's what i want to ask ron and, and i didn't mean it wasn't technically possible i was talking more about the feasibility of like requiring that for counselors that every time they meet with someone you know pushing it out and i think what our conversation was at that time was you know, if it was just a push and say I met with your student today and that would be it, that would, I think, for, if a parent received that, then there's going to be questions. Well, what was that about? Whatever. I guess what I also think about is I think what we really want to try to cultivate is that open communication between student, child, and parent, right? So, exactly. I mean, if I was a parent, I would say to my child every day when they got, when they got home, what happened at school today? Did you talk to a counselor today? How did it go today? versus putting the kind of onus on the counselor to to say to the te to this parent i met with your child today then the parent's going to say either to the counselor or the te or the student what what did you talk to the counselor about today i think what we want to do is help build you know why that communication happening between child and parent right yeah so so i just would respectfully disagree with with that I, I do i do agree with the with the idea that it's between the parent and the and the, and the student 100 percent agree there yeah, i just sure. think you know what time out, time out. first off we are way off in the weeds here right <laughs> a minute this is a conversation we should have okay but this talking about it during our data <laughs> and it update is not the Fine. time or the place we, we know that it's possible we know that it's possible so the next step is so the next step is yeah. so, is so we yeah, if this is a conversation we want to have then let's figure out how we want to do that and what the legalities are so I okay so let me be super clear I feel like I've asked this question three or four times so and and again what the board has to remember you're a collective body that okay. provides direction to the superintendent so, so when one board member says to me I want you to do X I need to know is that something that the entire board is providing me direction to do and if so then I'm going to execute on that direction so that's what I need the board to have the conversation about and provide me with that direction as a collective body if that's what you want done okay okay so one second so let's stay let's stay on IT here for a second I have one question and I'm, we're going to excuse you because you've been up here <laughs> for a really long time shelf life or, or useful life of the Chromebooks you told me at one time is it four years five years what's, uh, what's your, your we try for five years is what we're trying for we've got some that are slightly longer we of course have some that get damaged so badly that 
they die earlier. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Any, any, one any, one I, final I, I, IT related, related question. <laughs> IT. The the thing that um, Diane was talking about with social media, it's kind of up on your screen, teacher screen. Is that an extension or is that automatically pop up? I guess I'm just I'm just wondering if the teachers have the ability to follow directions on how to make sure that that's up and they know how to use there, it. There there are directions out there for them. We do trainings and send okay. out information a couple times a year on it. Um, I know hundreds of them that are, are using it. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure everyone I, knows where to find the directions, okay. how to do it, how, all yeah, that I, stuff. I, so. I think it's well communicated out. If you quiz the new teachers, probably not because they're going through the new teacher training and getting that stuff now. but. Uh, any of the staff that have wanted to do something like that, I know they've received many communications okay. on it because we've been using the product multiple years now. Okay. So I'll, I'll let you know what they tell me when I ask them, just so we're, we're good. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And, and if they have some that don't think they know, we can sure fix that. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. We got peppered tonight. Yeah. yeah. You got <laughs> once a year. It's once a year. <laughs> it's over. I'll see you again well, in next year. Uh, I was say. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate Thank it. All right, next up is the role of the student board representative, Dr. Pierce. Okay, well, uh, this I think is more of a board uh, discussion. I know Mr. Galbraith had an idea about uh, potentially having the um, student board member do a project of some sort. So uh, I have the policy, the existing policy that I can bring up, which I will just so you, you know, see what it says and then you know this is a good example of here's something that like an idea right that an individual board member had and now it's up to the board to have a conversation about it and then if we need to update policy to reflect that board direction then we would we would do that so i don't know um i think i'll yeah. maybe turn it back over to you mr connors to turn you know to pose the yeah, question yeah. or maybe yeah, ask so mr galbraith could you bring that up please I yeah, I, that would be appreciated thank you so Gates, you had so what's your what's your idea here? Yeah, so I asked Dr. Pierce to bring this to our attention. Just I feel like with the student rep, like sorry, I I would like to discuss them doing something like tangible that at the end of their time they have something that they can come back and say, this is what I did over the course of the not just showed up to meetings and voted and shared a couple things, but like something like they can bring to the board where they actually work on additional skills like. Maybe they've got to go out and communicate with a bunch of other people. They got to delegate some tasks. They got to present to the board, like just something tangible at the end of their time here on, on the board. Um, if I'm being honest, I don't, I mean, with London, I don't, and, and I talked to her a little bit about this. I don't feel like we necessarily really utilized her in a way I think we could have um, and, and some of her abilities. Um, Zach was big in the legislator thing, so he was doing all that stuff kind of go-getter um, but I just I think just in talking it'd be nice to have something tangible for them to to do like either project wise or lead on or help on or something that they can say this is my impact I made while I was a, a student rep and I know um, Dr. Pierce kind of had an idea of one thing but um, almost like a like a just some sort of pro like just something like what like an Eagle Scout project kind of yeah, go ahead. Sure. Well, I, I think I want to hear what you have. To, then I have a question. Okay. Yeah, when um, when the the idea uh, came up, um, I was sharing with uh, Gabe that on our um, draft objectives, which you all have not seen yet for the next year, they're in development, and you'll see them soon. Um, one of the ideas that I had was to host uh, a two time two times throughout the year. Um, uh, like a s listening sessions with students for middle and high schools. Uh, and so when when that idea came up, I was thinking maybe that's something that could be that the student board reps could be tasked with helping to put together, helping determine what the what the topics are, helping facilitate those. So it would be work that, you know, is kind of uh, that we're wanting to, to do. It wouldn't be like a made up project, not that what you're suggesting would be a made up project, but something that's, you know, part of our strategic work for the year and that we would be, um, you know, leaning on the student board reps to really help run that. And it seemed like a good fit because it's student listening sessions 
and connected to the student superintendent student advisory council group. So that's one thought I had. Yeah. So the thought that I have is, um, oh, go ahead, Ron. You had a question. I can I can wait. Go. Sure. I'm gonna I'm you. The thought I had was like. Um, I don't know if it, there's any scouts in here, but I was an Eagle Scout. And so like you, with, when you're a scout, you go through all these years of training, you learn all these different skills, right? And then at the end of it all, you have this thing called a, your Eagle Scout project. And and that's sort of like the the practicality or the, the utilization of all those skills you've earned. And it could be a whole variety of things, but then you have a project and you organize people and it, you know, and that's your kind of your final stamp on on that. So um, something like that almost, but if they come into it, maybe we can have a list of things or ideas and they can kind of pick one or or choose something that's similar to one of those things. And that could be sort of like their their project throughout the year that they're working on. Like I, I know that our new our new student rep, Mallory, she, she's 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 talked a lot about communication and and so she maybe her project might have something to do with that, um, in that in that world. So that's kind of my thought, my spin on it. I actually think it's a good idea, uh, but I have two things. I would like to see it. The student reps take time out from their regular time to be a student rep, and it it, it could you know add up. I know London was doing sports studies in this, and it's a lot. So I would like for it, them to get credit for it uh, in their uh, for their study uh, for school. Uh, whether it's tied into a history class, a math class, or whatever class or school project, I would also like to see them get some kind of uh, credit at school for doing the extra work. And uh, I don't know if we could do it to our present. Uh, I, I don't know if we could apply it to our present rep because that wasn't part of the uh, application. You know that that yeah the the advertisement we put out there for this position, we didn't say it then you had to do a project. Right. So it would have built applied to new applicants from now on. I suggest that unless they volunteer to yes. take on a project. The um, so Gabe, I guess I I had I have no issue about it. I just tried would like to know exactly I'd like to have more framework around what the expectations are because you don't want to I think if there's a specific ask from the board to, hey, look, we would like to, you to work on this, or hey, you know, we want to get this type of feedback from the students, or if, if there's a need we're looking for, I think that would be a great way to, to start. Uh, I think making it too, you know, overwhelming, you don't want to drop it on their shoulders. So in, in anything, any guidance we could provide would be good. Yeah, and I, I mean, all, all the discussion I think is, is what we needed. I mean, we just need to discuss what what it looks like. Ultimately, working backwards for me, it's just what what at the end of their time is tangible that they can say their their impact was on the the board or the the school district or whatnot, right? So if there's something that they're passionate about and they feel like it's going to improve the district, I mean, for instance, I like the initial thought that I just kind of was spitballing in my brain before talking to Dr. Pierce was okay. So maybe they find something they want to do in the district and improve and they go out and they coordinate it all and they present it at the end of their at the end of their time on the board and then the board has that for yes or no right I mean there's no guarantees that we would approve or not approve what they did but we would they would have that opportunity to go through the process and get feedback and work with others and delegate and some of those things so but again it's all like we just need to discuss it yes. This is technicality. They have been, they, they have, we've had some very good luck with our student mm -hmm. reps. It, it, I know you didn't mean it, Gabe, but something you said is that I don't know if they've been, you know, helpful or support. They have. I mean, London, she came in and she told us she didn't do the vote, but she told us about what the atmosphere was at the schools and stuff like that. So I don't want to not give them credit for what they've done. Right. I think it's a great idea, but. But let's not tarnish what we've already had. In, but we have some excellent students. Yeah, and I, I'm not saying they didn't, because I know some of them did some yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. stuff. I just, I just know I talked to London recently and, and brought it up to her, and she's like, "Yeah, I think that would be something, you know, she could, she could support." So I, I don't know the particulars, but I <laughs> because she doesn't have to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's a great. Because she's because she's <laughs> studying at Clemson now, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, obviously there probably needs to be other discussion. I. I actually like the idea Dr. Pierce had with them 
kind of taking on the lead of the, the student summit and all that because there's going to be a lot of pieces to that and it highlights a lot of our goals so that could be something that they do going forward but cool. so maybe um, based on everything that you're saying my suggestion would be that maybe for this upcoming year i engage our student reps in the um, the summit work that we talked about and that we put on future agenda for discussion. I can bring some proposals based on what you've talked about, ideas for um, kind of building in this project requirement into the policy and potentially having the student be able to earn elective credit too. Um, because I think you're right, like if we did that, we would probably want it to apply to the the, um, I'm trying to think of what year that will be. It would be the two years. right two years from now because we've already got our student rep for 23-24 and our student rep for 24-25 because we've got a rep elect, right? Mm -hmm. And they both got sort of on without having this requirement be part of the requirement. I mean, and then what, so it would apply, we would update the policy but and so forth, but it would apply beginning with the 20, 25, 26 school yeah. year. Is that kind I, of what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, sure, but I don't see any harm in asking the, the two to take something on like this. I mean, you, you, yeah. yeah, you, you get out in the real world and contracts and amendments are done all the time to things and every job description says other duties as That's described. Right. So like, these are pretty go getters. Yeah, so you know, I, I think could probably ask yeah. them. they wouldn't, yeah. we could ask them, but yeah, like it. Is that kind of consensus there, what you want me to do? Okay. Uh, one, one other thing, also include a guidance counselor, because you could, do they even do that anymore? You remember when they, to graduate, you had to do um, public service or? Community, community, service. Service. community service? You don't have to do community that anymore. Service. Okay. All right. All right, never mind. Diane told me to shut up. <laughs> I said, don't do that anymore. She does hit me too. I don't know if you guys saw that. Perfect. Okay, so we've got, I think we've got direction. Thank you very much. Is there anything else on the student board representative? We good? Good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, next we have no unfinished business. So we are on to new business. We have policy 6100 administration line staff chart. Dr. Pierce. Well, we have a number of policies this evening. Uh, 6100 is one that we look at each year and update to reflect uh, current. So this is our staff line uh, org chart and um, it's a functional org chart. And so what you're seeing here are the uh, stri is the strike through underline version. And I, I also can, you have a, a clean copy in your board packet too. Uh, with just a few little modifications, uh, we have one assistant superintendent for K-12, that's Matt Scott. Uh, we shifted, we used to have two assistant superintendents in elementary and a secondary, and now we have one in directors at, at the um, elementary and secondary level. Uh, we didn't, we noticed as we were reviewing this, we really didn't call out school safety as a function, which is a really important function in our organization. So um, that is now ca called out under K-12. Um, just some wording updates. We also called out highly capable because it wasn't clearly specified where highly where highly capable fit um, and it's part of teaching and learning. Uh, we added activities to athletics because that's ASB and those kinds of things. Um, it's it's not just athletics, it's athletics and activities. Um, you'll notice under uh, under human resources par, the teacher peer assistance and resources you know, the, the program for supporting new teachers has long been a part there, uh, but we also are working to develop systems and supports for principals, uh, both, you know, new principals and, um, you know, all throughout their career. And so uh, Doug and his role is taking a more kind of intentional role in doing that in partnership with, with K-12 and teaching and learning. And then we updated uh, communications to reflect that it's, uh, our change to from just community education to community and family education. If you remember based on 
all of the kind of shift in the um, role and we are in the process of finalizing hiring for that position as we speak. We need to have a we need to have a motion to adopt, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt policy the correction uh, the policy sixty one hundred as presented. I'll second. First and second, do you have any other questions or comments? If not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Okay, hey, Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Thunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, one, one related thing, if oh, I can, uh, it's it's not a, a policy, it doesn't need to be voted on or anything, but I want to show you what has come up in the past and uh, is the fact that that's a functional org chart and that's helpful, but it's not a people org chart that shows who who sits in, in different seats at, uh, at the district office. And so we ha now have uh, people uh, kind of like reporting structure org chart uh, that aligns to that functional org chart that's part of policy. And so I just want to bring this up to you and then I will send it to you. We also have created a pretty detailed roles and responsibilities chart for each department. So it really details who are all the people in all of these departments and what do they do. The org chart that you're seeing here on the screen is really just um, uh, district administrators, right? So it's like managers, um, assistant directors, directors, and uh, cabinet level. Uh, and then of course you're on there <laughs> and I'm on there. So it really shows the, the reporting relationship that the board of directors as a body provides direction to me as superintendent. We get counsel, right, from our district legal counsel, Bronson, and then um, your direction to me then flows through to the rest of the organization through me um, and uh, cabinet members and the people who report to them. So we'll get this on the district website. There's still a couple of TBDs as we're finalizing hiring. I've been providing you with personnel updates throughout the summer, but uh, this isn't something that we've had before and now we have one. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Okay, next up, policy 2164, instruction, career, and technical education. Dr. Okay, Pierce. thank you. So you're, you'll remember that the entire 2000 series of policies was reviewed and updated last year, and uh, legal references were updated and all of those kind of things. There were two policies that we put on hold so we could look at a little more carefully, and, and you're going to see those in a minute, but um, CTE, you did approve the career and technical education um, updates previously, but in looking at it again, uh, we made some additional ads so it uh, better aligns with the WASDA model policy. So the WASDA model policy contains all of the information that you see here. Our previous policy stopped at this little first tiny paragraph. <laughs> and so there was quite a bit of just uh, additional information that was missing from the policy around CTE advisory committees and things like that. Things that we do reflects current practice, but now the policy has been updated to really better reflect current practice and align with WASDA model policy and have all of the uh, correct legal references, which it did before, but um, that's, that's really why you're seeing this tonight. So it hadn't been updated in 12 years? <laughs> well, it got updated, remember, yes, because we haven't, you know, we now have a process for having all of our policies uh, reviewed and updated on a regular basis. But yeah, prior to June, it hadn't been updated since 2011. Well, I guess I'm cheating and figuring that June and August are pretty much the same update. <laughs> I know, so I know. Since, right. <laughs> and it was just updated a month ago. Just update, exactly. Perfect. Any Comments, questions, thoughts? I just have a quick question. It, it says committees will advise the district on labor markets and programs. Is that the committee? Is that from internal like teacher committees or is that like community partner committees or In, a industry combination? Partners. Industry partners. Right, and, and staff. So the, the CTE advisor committees uh, are required to have industry partners. Okay. So industry partners and CTE teachers along with the CTE leadership, uh, TriTech and our CTE department partnered together for this. So um, they're looking at needs of uh, business in the community and region. 
Thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve policy 2164 as written. Okay. We need first and second reading on this, or is this? For first and second. Yeah, perfect. There you go. Thank you. Second. Excellent. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'll call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Next on the agenda is policy 2314 for instruction, use of outside media resources in the classroom. Okay, so this is one uh, that the board did look at in June when you approved the whole series. Um, but this is one uh, where, uh, again, it, individual board member, Mr. Galbraith had some questions about uh, the policy. So I have a little bit of information and then um, I'm sure Gabe will provide some information too. Um, so I just have a couple of quick slides. I don't have a policy revision um, prepared because I thought you'd probably want to talk about it first and then we could get it on the agenda or you could just, you know, if you, if you wanted to make the revisions, you could do that this evening. I'm not sure where you're going to go with this. So uh, let me just get started here. So policy 2314 pertains to use of outside media in the classroom um, and it has sections about uh, med uh, movies. What, kind, what ratings of movies can be shown and TV programs and things like that. So the current wording in the policy says elementary students in K-5 will be shown only G-rated films. PG-rated films may be shown to students in grades 6 through 12 if they're previewed completely, approved by parents and principal, and permission received from parents. PG-13 rated films may be shown to students in grades 9 through 12 if they're previewed completely, approved by the principal, and permission is received from parents. No R or X rated films may be shown at any time to any student. So the wording changes that uh, are you know up for uh, board discussion, I, um, the, I, the thinking is around the G rating for K-5 and uh, PG ratings for 6-12. So, um, and I think I got that wrong. Uh, you'll have to help me, Gabe, I'm sorry. It's, 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 the wording is the wording same, is right? But but I think the you, idea is, you, should this be reduced to like K- Yeah, the, the discussion I wanted to have yeah. was changing the, I was talking about changing the elementary student grade to K through two, and then allowing PG in grades three through 12. Um, and there, and I do apologize, I was waiting for this to come up and I just missed it in the consent agenda in June. So that's why I asked um, Dr. Pierce if we could look into it. But ultimately, um, I think at that point, a, a couple things um, in, in just some research I did. So uh, it, it's almost like G movies are, are going away. So probably in the next 10 years, they won't even have a G rating. Um, in the industry since 2017, they've only they've only had 25 G movies. Just how many years? I'm sorry. Since 2017, they've only done 25 G movies, and it just keeps getting less and less each year. And so, um, some of the things as a I guess as a teacher, you, I mean, you could play the old like All Dogs Go to Heaven, a movie which ha has some stuff in there from back in when it was done that people could feel or you know parents need to sign off on. Um, but you can't play like Moana or Up or The Lion King or Madagascar or any of those movies right now under the under the current policy. So I just want to have a discussion to see if there was any interest in in moving that to three through twelve. Um, that way, some of those you know third grade and up can have those movies played if they're approved. Yes, sir. I think they all should be reviewed and released by parents. I mean, I say that, I stick my neck out a little bit because I say that because the early um, Uncle Remus movies um, and even some of the Walt Disney Minnie Mouse movies were not suitable for my kids. 
and uh, it was innocent enough, but if you look at them now, you will shake your head if you see what I could point out to you in those movies. So as a parent, I would like to even review the G-rated movies to make sure there isn't something that is objectable to me that I can say, hey, uh, I'm going to hold my kid back from the day that you watch this movie. Whether it's G-rated, PG-13, or RX, I think the parents should be given a chance to know that this movie is going to be shown. I don't. I don't. I, I'm okay with that. With, with Ron's idea, I mean, but not RX. I think that's a, just a no go. But and I know that's what he said. But, <laughs> but the but the yeah. I, I don't. I have no problem with. The, I think the more the parents are involved, the better. And I think, from my experience, most teachers do do that, but probably not all. And I think most parents don't think about that either. I think you bring up a great point. Oh, it's a G-rated movie. It's going to be okay. Well, old G-rated movies, as we know, are not sometimes a little inappropriate these days. So that's, that's a good point. So let's say you have a third grade class, for example, and they want to watch whatever, Moana or something. Now, technically, right now they can't, but then they send it out to all the parents and they say, can we watch this? Never says, yeah, then. Or, or if you don't want your child to, then you can say, watch today. Right. So he doesn't get to watch that. Okay, so we're looking to change the wording to move this from K, so K through two, is that what you're thinking, or K through three? That's tight. Yeah, I, I initially, I mean, K, two. K, K through two and then three through 12. And then I think Ron was wanting to add in that even the, the K through two get the just the parental permission. slip permission. Just notification. And, and I would think something like that could be done at like an open house. Parents could sign off on yeah, in the beginning of the year. potential movies. Here's a list of movies we're going to watch. Right. Sign off and we know that part of it, unless you have, assuming we have 100% participation in the open house. Yeah. I think yeah. typically when it comes to parent permission and opting out processes, it's done, you know, like two weeks prior. It, it's done prior, oh. like in close proximity right. to the, the instruction um, versus sort of a blanket kind of a thing. So I, I what I'm what I'm hearing is changing updating the policy to say elementary students in grades two wait K through two will be shown only G rated movies. PG rated films may be shown to students in grades three through twelve. And in all cases I mean I'll figure out the wording, but in all cases parent permission must be received like to for the child to watch the movie. And I mean, I think one thing to say too is I know, you know, typically movies aren't, you know, part of the instructional program. I mean, they, they should be used pretty infrequently. I know they're used for rewards and things like that. But, um, you know, for the most part, there's, you know, there's, they're not like, shouldn't be, I would say, widely used on a daily basis because because we're yeah. teaching the you know adopted curriculum and not just watching movies but there are times where it's appropriate and as a reward and those kinds of things and they are shown so but i think that's true for our academic things that we show students too because if you go i'm going to pick nova because that's something that we use a lot in science classes there are ratings based on that 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 a you know first or second grade teacher may want to use but it may not fit into our previous language or current language. So the the pol the current policy does speak to TV ratings too, uh, and I did look those up to make sure that they're still up to date, and they are. In terms of those ratings are still used when it comes to TV programs and things. So what I can do, I, I don't, I, I, I like I said, I wasn't sure if this is where the discussion was going to go, so I don't have a red line version of the policy to present to you. Uh, but what, what we can do is put it on the agenda for mm -hmm. next meeting. And then uh, you could also look at those TV, the TV rating portion of the policy to see if there's something there that you wanted to update. I have a fundamental question. Can you, can a, could a teacher put like a, a form on Parent Square for parents to? I, I'm going to have to follow up on that. I, I don't know. Do mm -hmm. yeah. 
Ron, well, Ron, no, Ron knows the answer. Ron, we, we have a form system through Power School that can do that exactly this. It's designed to handle the parents want to sign that off on that slip, they can do that. It's forms as the product. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and do we use that right now, Ron? Yeah, like, we use it for some of the sports stuff. We yeah. use it for the okay. registration. Mm -hmm. um, teachers have been using it for take home or uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to follow up because I know we've got some opt out processes around other like curricular areas. And so I just, we can talk more about how to <laughs> make it easier for teachers and parents to to do this to align with the policy. I'll follow up with staff on that. I and I also I guess I want to say that I love having that there already, but I don't want it to be passive. Like it's there, go look for it. Because what you're saying is correct. Teachers always said a week or two before the movie or whatever, this is what we're going to do or the activity. I want that still to be there. So Me it's uh, an active thing to do. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So we will instruct you to rework this and bring it back to us here in a meeting or two. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, OK, next up, <laughs> uh, policy 2414, instruction, alternative learning experience programs. OK, so the next two, 2414 and 2415, are two that we did not include in the whole 2000 series package in June because we wanted to spend a little more time uh, looking at the our policy language and um, making sure it aligns with WASDA policy and all of the legal references. It just needed a little more work. So um, 2414 is, it was alternative learning experience programs. Those are ALE programs. Uh, we updated that to say alternative learning experience courses because that's uh, what the WASDA model policy language says. And um, there's not really, there's a lot of wording changes and updates, but uh, it, it's really to reflect current practice more than anything else. And mo a lot of the strike through was just moved to the first part of the policy, uh, like in terms of the annual board reporting that's still there. It's just in a different spot. Any questions or comments on this policy and the changes? Mm -hmm. Okay, if not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, in motion. Excuse me, excuse me. Can we move yep. both 14 and 15 at the same time? Or do they have to be separate? I think we need to do separate. Separately. Okay. Um, so I move to approve policy 2414 ALE courses for first and second reading. Second. Okay. Now, any questions or comments? If not, we'll call the vote. We'll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Ballantyne? Yes. Ms. Sunbit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is policy 2415, instruction online learning. I'll move to approve 2415 <laughs> online <laughs> learning for first and second reading. Well, there you go. Okay. Sorry, just real quick. The amended date says August 10th. I don't know if we need to oh. change, change that. Yes, thank you. Good catch. Sorry about that. Did the other one too. I actually didn't look at that one. I just noticed. No. Nope. Second. The. Okay. Okay. Any questions or comments? If not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Okay, Mr. Galbraith. Yes. Mr. Valentine. Yes. Ms. Senbit. Yes. Mr. Mabry. Yes. And Mr. Connors. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last policy of the evening. Policy 7430, financial management, lease capitalization threshold. Vic, we missed you. Where have you been? Yes, likewise, yes. So you might remember last year this time we had uh, the GASB number 87 mm -hmm. uh, was revised um, that dealt with uh, 
putting like a copier, if we pay for a copier, say $10,000, or, or we enter an agreement for two years, and that is an agreement is like $5,000, we have to put that $5,000 as a liability on our balance sheet. And if we pay $2,500 a year, we have to go back and make that change. So at that time, it, you know, in a $300 million budget, for us to get all the copy leases and all that type of thing, it just it is immaterial. So now they've come back and changed uh, added GASB number 96, which deals with subscription-based information technology arrangements. So sometimes we might have a, a software license for some curriculum where um, it's a three-year deal and maybe it's uh, $20,000 a year. So they're gonna, the auditors would say, we well, need to put $60,000 as a liability on your balance sheet. And every year you have to reduce that by $20,000. And we just don't have uh, any, if you don't have a policy, you have to put all those on there. And last year we did 1.5% for the GASB 87. Uh, now they're saying, well, no, you can't use a percent. You have to use a dollar amount. And, and that's about what it worked out to be was $5 million. So we've changed the policy to address the GASB 96 on the subscription-based information. And we've changed the threshold from 1.5% to 5 million. And that should, uh, nothing should it should hit that and if, it, if it was over five million you probably would want to see that as a liability you know on the balance sheet as it's kind of like like debt but uh at this point we don't see anything hitting that and uh, if we didn't have that uh, we do have some software agreements not uh, material but uh, enough that would cause a lot of tracking so I mean, in the private sector, you know, we lease stuff so we can keep it off our balance sheet. That's what we do it. So I'm trying to figure out what, what's the... Uh, well, this what's is governmental <laughs> accounting standards board. They're another, their own okay. little rule committee. Uh, that's, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. Yeah. I'm like, that's kind of stupid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yes, Diana. So does this put us more in line with what the auditors were uh, poking at us last year? Um, Remember when we did the exit, there were some comments and they were somewhat connected to this. There might have been. Well, they did comment about the percent, I think, changing. Right. Yeah, that we got to change that. So this would be something that they wouldn't give us. I think they call it. No, if on. we don't do this now, we did, we would uh, they would get on us. Okay. Yeah, because this, this will apply toward the financial statements that end August 31st. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Not, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I'll motion to approve policy 7430 uh, lease capitalization threshold for first and second reading as written. I'll second. Perfect. Any other questions or comments? If not, I will call the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunfit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. That was your shortest yes. presentation ever. <laughs> Yay. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, next up is our next meeting agenda. We have the K-12 student goal report, academic growth and proficiency targets, and get to know KSD. Anything else you'd like to put on there? I'll just, I'll wait for a few months to bring okay. that up. I'll bring it up in three months. Perfect. There's Any also the, safe, yes. the safety update. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. And then policy 2314. I think I can get that done for the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, no, I wasn't even looking for like an official update, just even in your superintendent report would, for the SRO, SSO stuff would probably be fine. So just like. You don't have to put together like a big presentation. I, I don't want you to have to do that, but it, I just okay. something to share. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I want to. I want to know what Micah is waiting to put on. He's waiting to I leave to put something on there. Waiting a couple of minutes. Oh, uh, about the laws and the and the, le the legalities and laws of the push notifications to the council from the counselors. Okay, All right, I'll let you do that. Now. Just kidding. I, I do want to bring up a couple <clears> of <throat> things, and it includes Micah. Annual conference for WAS is coming up. And uh, as the WASA president, present president, I sure would love for my council, my fellow members to be there. So please, please consider attending. Aren't we already signed up? Did this for November? Mm -hmm. so, I thought I 
Is everybody signed up? We're signed up, up yeah. already. I'm actually speaking at a conference the day before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. If I give, or that's I mean, Ron, I, I gave my word I'd be there to support you, and that's what I'm going to do. I appreciate it. That's it means a lot. I'm, I'm serious. It means a lot if your boy shows up. We're going to heckle you too after your <laughs> speech, though, just so you're. You know aware. what? I've never been nervous, but my wife is going to be there, so oh. I know I could take the heckling, but knowing my wife is in the con <laughs> and the audience is going to be tough. Silently judging you. Mm. <laughs> I, hear, I, hear about, I hear about my North Carolina accent. I have to work. It's all good. It's going to be good. And there's one other thing, and you probably have, well, the general session for the legislative uh, is going to be a month before then. September. Yeah, September. I don't, the 29th, I think. And, the and we can do that online. Yes. But you, you, you might want to tune in on that too, just to see the process and hear the things that, that's been uh, voted on. As an emphasis for the next legislative session. I think the, hand, the handbook, while the handbook's out now, too, right? Mm -hmm. we can go Except for remember that will be updated. So. Yeah. Okay. But it gives you a good idea. But there's still a few more things that are coming up on it. But yeah, going online and watching it, A, is easier and B, saves yeah. money. Um, and it, it really gives you a lot of information about other people's thinking and where mm -hmm. things come from and all of that. Yeah. And there's a couple of big things that you really want to be aware of. One of them being uh, weighted votes. Yes. Okay. All right. So we have no other business, but we're going to go into executive session for Superintendent Cabinet Performance. And how long will our executive session be? So I can add 20 minutes to it? <laughs> so you can add. Um, <laughs> so you can add. 30 minutes. 30 minutes? All right, well, I'm going I'm to hold you to 30. I think we can do it in 30 minutes. I'm feeling good about it. All right, so we're going to adjourn the public portion of the meeting and we'll go to executive session for roughly 30 minutes. Thank you very much for your participation.